to Ephesians chapter 4. So if you want to open your app up, the Anthem app up, we got all the notes there, or just bring your Bible, whatever you guys want to do. Um, but we're going to start on Ephesians 4. And really the subject of Ephesians 4, the first couple verses that we're going to study today, 1 through 16, is really about unity in diversity. Let me say it again. Unity in diversity. And so we all know that God didn't make us the same way, but somehow we're supposed to be fit together as one body in Christ. And what I like about this chapter is that even though, you know, I probably wouldn't even know you guys unless we went to church together, if it was in a different life. You know, we all like different activities. I like surfing. You like, you know, painting or whatever. It's through the church that we all become linked and grown together in love. And that's what we're going to study this morning. Now, I read a story the other day that a Christian was stranded on a, on a, on a desert island. And uh, finally the rescuers came and they found out that the man had actually built three churches there. And then they, uh, they looked and they asked the guy, like, why did you, you know, why'd you build three churches? And the guy was like, uh, you know, points to the first church. He's like, that's the church I go to right there. Then he points to the second church. He's like, that's the church I used to go to. That's the church right there. And then the third one, he points to and says, that's the church I'll never go to. And so a lot of times, this, this, that's what kind of unity is like, right? It feels like sometimes we desire it, we need it, we know that we need to be joined together as one body in Christ, but it's like grasping at the wind, you know, it's grasping at the air to see how that unity can actually happen. But it was really Jesus' heart, Paul's heart, that we'd have that unity, and that's really what I want to look at this morning. Uh, this is really wrapped around a little verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. It's this, and I'm going to have you repeat it for, uh, with me so you can see the whole point of the passage. All the verses are wrapped around this one central verse, and it's this. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Can you say it with me? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Just one more time. Then I know you have it in your heart. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Doesn't that feel good just to say it together? That's incredibly unifying, and that's really what Paul's heart was for the church, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the first part of the section of this passage that we're going to look at, we're going to look at how to walk in that unity, and Paul has some specific things that he wants us to know in order to walk in that unity. And the second part is how the gifts of the Spirit actually bring unity to the body, and that's in the later part of the verses in Ephesians that we're going to look at, so the, look at a little bit this morning as well. So we're going to look at how to walk in unity, Paul has some comments there, and then it's how the gifts of the Spirit bring that unity in the church. So let's pray, and then we'll dive right in. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful, Lord, that, that you desired from the very beginning that we would be one. You prayed to the Father that we would be one. And Lord, it seems, though, sometimes this unity within the church and between the churches can be so hard to have. But, Lord, we know that you just admonished us from your scripture to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we pray that that would be that way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first verse of this chapter is this, in Ephesians 4, verse 1. It says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And the word that he really starts us with is therefore. Anytime that you see a therefore in Scripture, what are you supposed to look for? Why is the Therefore. And in this case, this splits the book of Ephesians right down the middle. In chapters 1 through 3, we learn about the wonders of what it means to know Jesus and his ultimate plan for redemption and salvation of the world. It's an incredible, it's an incredible section of scripture. I hope that you read and you meditate upon that again this week because there's so many wonderful truths there. It's what the Bible calls doctrine, which are kind of the core teachings about the church there and about Jesus Christ himself and how amazing he is. We learned about how he blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, that he chose us before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters. He accepted us in Jesus. He redeemed us through his blood. He sealed us with his Holy Spirit. He guaranteed us an internal inheritance. Now, those are some amazing truths, and a lot of times it seems like it's so heady. It's like so, like, in the clouds, but it's a spiritual reality that we live within, and Paul needed to put that out in the first three chapters of Ephesians so that we would know that. 
And that really builds to the prayer that Paul has in Ephesians chapter 3 that Pastor Nate preached on last week. He did a phenomenal job on that, by the way. Right? And I hope that you've been praying that over your families, over your spouse, over your, over your kids this week. You know, that you would be strengthened with might in your inner being. That Christ would dwell in your heart by faith. That you'd be rooted and grounded in love and know the length and width and depth and height. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. That's an amazing prayer. And as you memorize it and think about it and have it in your heart, it really takes all those truths that you learned about in Ephesians 1 through 3 and places them in your prayer life that you can pray over your family and your kids. How many people have been praying that this week? It's awesome. It's wonderful. If you have it, I really encourage you to do so because it's an incredible way to pray pray spiritual strength right into your, your husband, your wife, and your family. Now, as you understand and as you know that, those truths, what it does is it creates within your soul and within your spirit a great outflowing of love, right? As you know what Jesus has done for you, as you know that amazing death that he died to pay the debt for your sin, the spiritual blessings that you have in him, his choosing of you, what that starts to do is it wells up in your very soul an incredible sense of the love of God within your heart. And that's why Paul prays in that prayer that they would know the love of God that passes knowledge, right? It's beyond what you know. It's actually an experiential sense of the love of God within your heart. And that's what's so amazing about that prayer is that it tells us that we just don't need to know head knowledge. We actually need to know what that love of Christ is living within our life, the very presence of God upon us. Amen? That's what, the point of the, that's what the point of the prayer is. Not that you would just know things, but that you would experience the love of God in a great way. Almost like a burst of love within your heart. And as you think about exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or imagine, by what? The power that works in us right? That power is working in you right now to experience God's sense of love and power within your life. And what it should do is it should breed just an awesome sense of wonder and awe of the majesty of God and that he loves you in such an incredible fashion to have chosen you, predestined you, blessed you with every spiritual blessing. That's what it should do. That's the intended purpose behind it. Now what that does after you experience that is that lays the foundation for Ephesians 4 through 6, which is the practical application part of it that we're going to read about today, right? But it all flows out of the experience of the love of God within your heart. And I want you to get that. Otherwise, I'm just telling you how to practically live out life, and I haven't explained to you that it's the love of God that really generates that within your soul with the desire to do that, right? We we all know like, hey, 10 steps to do this, 7 steps to do that, but there's no heart behind it. And what you really need to know is the love of God is really the basis of the practical living of the Christian life. And the experience of that is what will carry you through this life and into eternity. Amen? It's awesome. It's wonderful. So just thinking about that. Now, I know some of you guys... Maybe some of you guys are more on the doctrine part, where you love to know, like, the theology of, you know, of, of God, right? You need to know the amazing wonders and the knowledge and the revelation of him. And some of you guys are more on the practical side, which you just want to know, just tell me how to live it out. If you're more on the theology side, raise your hand. If you like just to know the love, okay, if you're like that. Now, if you're on the doctrine side or the practical side, where you just want to know how to live it out, raise your hand, right? You guys need each other. You guys need each other, right? We all need it because the book of Ephesians was written in exactly that fashion. Paul knew that there would be that two, those two different types of people. Those type of people that flip through Ephesians 1 through 3 and it's like, hey, Jesus loves me. That's all I really need to know. Let me just get to the practical side of things, right? But the fact of the matter is, is as you understand the depths of how Christ loves you and those amazing truths, those things actually found, form the basis of how to live practically within the Christian life. And you need both of those things in order to really work out your salvation, as Paul says, with fear and trembling. Another way to say it is this, is that you will live out what you believe, okay? You will live out what you believe. Whatever you believe in your heart, the great truths about Jesus that you, that you know, those are going to be the things that you live out. And you need those core things. You need the belief to form the principles for your foundation for the practical work that you that you walk in as you live your Christian life. 
So that's why in Ephesians 4.1, Paul says this. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, right? To walk worthy of the calling with which you are called basically refers to everything in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, right? The calling that he's talking about is your redemption in Jesus Christ, right? That's the thing that you were called to. You were called out of the grave to be redeemed by Jesus so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you were called. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is the way that you're supposed to do that. And again, this starts the practical side of Ephesians chapters 4 through 6. And I'll read this in verse 2. It says this, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And the way I'll say this is to truly know your identity in Jesus Christ as a son or daughter of Jesus Christ is to walk in humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Okay, humility here just means lowliness of mind. Uh, it means to be completely dependent upon Jesus for everything that he is. It's the opposite of pride, which leads to self-reliance, boastfulness, and regarding others as less important than yourself. So humility is really complete dependence upon Jesus, knowing that it's only by him that you live and exist and have your being. And then gentleness. That word speaks of self-control, a spirit that's tempered by restraint. If you look at the places that this is used within the word of God, it's, uh, you know, and, and it's used in situations in scripture where there's a correction needed. You're supposed to do that with a spirit of gentleness, restraining yourself from maybe how you would have acted if you'd allowed your anger to flare up. And then patience. And this word is translated in the New King James as long-suffering, which means that just coming alongside a person and being patient with them where they're at, right? Suffering long with them, even though they're not at the spot that you want them to be at. That's what patience is. And then it really culminates in bearing with one another in love. Basically, there's a heavenly tolerance that you have for Another, one another's shortfalls that only comes as you truly know Jesus Christ and how much he loves you. And so I think the one of the mistakes that we make in the Christian life, again, going back to Ephesians 1 through 3, is we forget how patient God was with us, right? We were dead in our sins, but God who is rich in mercy loved us and saved us, right? Right? So we need to know that. We need to be reminded of that. Because if we're not, what happens to us is that we end up being not loving, harsh, right? And prideful with those people around us. We forget the fact that God loved us so much that he forgave all our faults, that he's completely patient with us. Think about Jesus himself, the marvelous humility that he showed, the gentleness and restraint that he showed, right? The patience that he showed with people all the time for the bearing with one another in love. Think about his example, all right? He did that with everyone that he knew. But a lot of times what happens is that we forget about that, and then we treat others in a way that we would never want to be treated by God. So I just want to remind you of that. And what happens is that when we're not patient, gentle, uh, bearing with one another in love, we rebel against God, and then we represent God wrongly to those around us. It's a, it's a, it's a hard thing. Our Christianity, our love for Jesus, kind of gets mixed with the world's standards in which we still have this love for Jesus that we proclaim, but that our actions never really reflect it because we've forgotten how much God has forgiven us for. So again, Paul is encouraging us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that which we've been called into. Now, uh, he says to do this, we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, which is Ephesians 4.3. Now this, word, this verse, as I said, was the central verse in this passage. It means to pursue, to maintain. It has to be something that we have conscious effort and focus upon. As I said before, it can be grasping after the wind or after the air if we're not doing this. It's so hard to really keep a tab on this. Now, what does this endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace mean? Well, I'm going to need to explain to you a little bit of background. And what it means is that when Jesus went up to the upper room, right before he went to the cross and died, he spoke to his disciples some amazing things in that upper room. One of the things was this in John 16, 7. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Okay? Now, the helper there refers to the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Greek word paraclete that means the one that comes alongside, comfort, comforter, helper, and advocate. Now, this is the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus would be sent to dwell within us, to comfort us, to help us, and to advocate for us. And what we can learn from this is that every believer on the planet has that same Holy Spirit within them and so that we can be unified in the Spirit like Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 4. When Jesus went to the Father, he said, hey, it's to your advantage that I go to the way. Otherwise, the Spirit wouldn't come. It comes and dwells with, the Spirit comes and dwells within us. And then he basically unifies us all together by the same Spirit. And that's the amazing thing that Paul's in telling us to do from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. The point is this, is that since we as believers have the same Holy Spirit, we automatically have unity in the Spirit. It's an awesome thing. And all we're really being asked to do by Paul here is to maintain the unity that we already have. We don't need to strive to create it, but we do need to maintain it and preserve it and uphold it. Okay? The next thing that we're encouraged to do is to do that in the bond of peace. Now, the word for bond can be translated as fastener, something that holds wood together, like, a, you know, like a, two pieces of wood that you use a nail to hold together. And this is something that, uh, that we bond together in peace. It's those qualities of humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love, that produces that bond of peace between us. Now, this isn't something that's like conflict avoided, right? This isn't a peace by, that comes by avoiding conflicts, but it comes by actually working the tough issues out with one another and loving one another. That's what brings peace. This is a peace that's produced by humbling ourselves, to put others above ourselves, to be gentle and restrain ourselves when our anger starts to flare up, and to be patient with one another. This is a peace that we work hard to preserve and uphold and maintain. Now, my question here for you today is how are you doing with that, right? Now, uh, another way to ask that is who do you have issues with, right? <laughs> who, who in your life, you know, do you struggle humbling yourself with? Who are you tempted to be impatient with? Who stirs up in you a critical spirit that you speak a harsh word to their face or maybe even behind their back? And I challenge you to bring these people to prayer in your life because God's design for you and the fact that he's put the same Holy Spirit within you as he's put within them means that you should be able to have a unity of the spirit with them. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's not a different Holy Spirit that you have that they have and there should be that unity. And how do I know that you have somebody like that in your life? Well, because I have people like that in my life. <laughs> and I know it, right? My kids, after the 8.30 hour, I tend to get impatient, right? But I need to keep that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, right, before they go to bed, all right? Or maybe it's a family member that you struggle with, just patience, right? It, you can just tend to just say a harsh or critical word so easily to their face or behind their back. And what God wants for you is that you would maintain that unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace with them. Now, you might be saying to me, ah, Lars, I have you on this one. What if they're not a believer? They don't have the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Well, for those people, what you want to do is you want to actually have a testimony, right? You want to actually have the fruit of the Spirit displayed in your life so that they would be able to see it. You remember what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience. Gentleness, well, there it is right there again, right? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All of those things, right, should be on display in your life. So they're like, wait, I want Jesus. I'm convicted by how this person is treating me uh, with kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness, self-control. I want Jesus as a result from that. And so I encourage you today, we're going to have the prayer team up there, and I hope that you're able to pray over that person because God desires for you to be unified with them. Uh, the next couple of verses in verses four to, four to six, Paul talks about the foundation of our unity. I just want to read that for you. Uh, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. 
Now there's seven things here that Paul says are one. One, he says, there's one body. I mean, there's just, there's just one church, right? I know there's a lot of churches in Santa Barbara, but really there's just one church with Jesus Christ as the head. There's one spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit that unites us all together. There's one hope of our calling to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. There's only one Lord. There's only one that we call Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one faith, which is the gospel. There's only one baptism, which is the water baptism, in which we're, uh, we're, we're put down into the water, representing the death of Christ, coming back out of the water, which represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's one God and Father of all, who is above all, in all, in you all. It focuses on the sovereignty of God as one. Through each of these one statements, what Paul is emphasizing is the great unity that we have with fellow believers through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the, through these statements, these one statements, we're, can, we're encouraged and exhorted by, by Paul to walk in loneliness, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, I'll tell you, as, your, as one of your pastors, Pastor Nate as well, as we endeavor to do that between churches. I don't know if you know this, but we do a once-a-month prayer meeting with a Jubilee, kind of a citywide prayer meeting. We're going to the community prayer breakfast. We do our best to make sure that we're unified with other churches in our community because it's important to us. We love that. Even our homeless outreach that we do is five different churches coming together to reach out to the homeless. So it is our heart. We love other churches. In fact, we're praying for other churches this morning, and we know that God moves in all kinds of different expressions of his body here in Santa Barbara. So that is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, the second part that I want to consider with you this morning is the, how the gifts of the Spirit bring that unity. And for that, we're going to have to study verses 7 through 16. I'll just read verse 7 to you. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Okay, what this means is that we're all part of one body. We have one spirit. But each individual person has a special spiritual gifting that God has given them. And this is not the only place that it's said that way, but this is definitely a place where it says is that each one has been given a spiritual gift, all right? These are called grace gifts. And the reason that they're called grace gifts is because God, because God gives them, not because you're amazing or talented, because I know that you're amazing and talented, but it's out of God's grace and mercy that he gives those gifts. It's, they're not earned. God can give them to whoever he wants to because he's God. And he gives them out of his grace, out of his undeserved favor, just because he loves us. It's amazing. And so each person is given a gift of God's grace so that they would be able to use that in the body. If you're in construction, one way you can think about it is this. He not only gives you the tool for the job, but he gives you the power to use the tool, right? Right? So God not only gives you the gift, but he gives it to the proportion of Christ's gift. He gives you all the power that you need to use that gift as well. So not only did Jesus ascend into heaven to give us his spirit, but he also gave us supernatural gifts that we would be able to use within the church. And these, he gave it to the church as his body to be used by countless believers all over the world for all time to encourage and strengthen the body of Christ. This is the way that Jesus can leave from the earth, go into heaven, but still have his body, of which he is the head, on the earth, being filled with the Spirit, so that we'd be able to use the amazing gifts that he's given us. Now, Paul tells us how this happens in verses 8 through 10. This is kind of interesting, and I want you to get this. There he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended... What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. So what Paul's doing there is he quotes a psalm, it's called Psalm 68, about Jesus ascending on high and leading captivity captive and giving, giving gifts to men. Well, what this really means, it means that when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, this is really for the purpose of defeating Satan and the slavery that he had over humankind and to lead captivity captive. That's the way that Jesus would do this, right? 
He'd first defeat death by his death on the cross, and then he would raise up into heaven, proclaiming that, uh, that he has led captivity captive. So Jesus' ascending into heaven was for the purpose of sending his Holy Spirit, beginning at Pentecost, and distributing all those gifts of the Spirit to the church. Giving gifts to men is a direct reference to Pentecost and Jesus doing that uh, through the baptism of the Spirit that we see happen at Pentecost. This was the beginning of the outpouring of the Spirit in which we see all kinds of miracles and signs and wonders you can read about in the book of Acts and even continuing in today. So the way that Jesus would build his church and his kingdom and defeat the powers of Satan was through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that he would give us. In verse 9, we see that the supernatural gifting was really accomplished by Jesus ascending into heaven, defeating Satan by paying the debt for our sins in the slavery, but also his ascension that he might fill, over th- fill all things. Jesus' ascension into heaven really means that he has victory over all things. Now, this is exactly what Jesus again said in the upper room. It's what again he said in the upper room. He said this in John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Jesus' ascending to the Father was the way that he would impart to every believer worldwide spiritual gifts that would be used to build up the church and defeat the power of Satan. If Jesus, before Jesus ascended to the Father, there was no church. But the greater work is now accomplished by him sending his spirit to give gifts to all men. And that's what we see here in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, oftentimes what happens is that our gospel actually stops with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many times that I told people the gospel story in terms of Jesus' death and resurrection only. But what happened after the resurrection? Well, Jesus' ascension was that he went up into heaven declaring victory over all things and then filling the church with his spirit so that we could use all these spiritual gifts to build up his body. And a lot of times our gospel is so incomplete because we don't actually even finish the gospels that we're, that we're, that we're reading. I mean, it's almost like we tear out the last couple chapters of, uh, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and forget about the ascension and, fin- and finish with the resurrection. It's almost like if you guys were watching Top Gun, how many people have seen Top Gun out there? Awesome. What if I just shut it off three quarters of the way through? Would you be bummed? Of course you would. So Jesus' resurrection is not the end of the story. Let me tell you, Jesus is not on vacation in heaven. That's not why he ascended into heaven, right? He's like, I'm just going to wait this out, and then I'm going to come back again. No, Jesus' ascension was actually all about him declaring victory over the powers of Satan and evil by building his church and filling his church with the Spirit. And that's why, that's why it's so important in our, in our uh, description of the gospel story to really include the, uh, the ascension within it. Now, I want, to con- I want to consider the five giftings in this passage that are to bring unity in the church in verses 11 through 12. It says there, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So really, there's five giftings mentioned in, mentioned in this passage. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, and they're more mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Peter 4, Romans 12, but this is a good start. Now, each one of these is really important for the formation and the building up of the church. First, we have apostles, and that word means messenger. This is a person that's an ambassador for God's work. Uh, originally, the apostles were a person, uh, apostle was a person that was a witness of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and wrote Holy Scripture. But now we have what are called little a apostles, which have the gifting of church planning and missionary. Amazing people that have that gift. Then we have the gift of prophet. Those that have the gift of speaking messages from God that are consistent with God's word in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the word can be something from the past or the present or the futures. There are messages that are revealed by God himself and spoken through these messengers. They're not prophets in the same sense as they wrote books of scripture in the Old Testament, but their word of God must be tested by people in the church. Uh, then there's evangelists. And these, have, these are the people that have the spiritual gift of bringing good news to people. 
amazing people. We even have, I think, Nicole Hirsch here starting the Alpha class, which is a class for uh, unbelievers to come and know about Jesus Christ. Uh, people that are anointed evangelists. My friend Richard, I'm not sure if he's here today. People that are just particularly anointed to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Then we have pastors and teachers, and those are two gifts that actually have some overlap. Pastors are people that shepherd or care for people's souls, and that kind of overlaps with teaching because that's how you care and shepherd people's souls, by teaching the truth about Jesus. All of those uh, five gifts are really represented right here, but there's many more in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4, and we see those operating all over our church on Sunday morning. Elizabeth Hare and Cheryl Newton and Ken Newton over here in the Connect area. All the people that are ministering to our children. People that have gifts of helps that help set this thing up every single morning. All kinds of giftings are really represented in this amazing church that we call Anthem Chapel. And the point of these gifts or is that we, as we use them, we all come to a greater unity in Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing and wonderful thing. Uh, Paul says it this way in verse 12. He says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you catch that? Is that every single one of those gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, are all there for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. When we're up here teaching you, it should be equipping you so that you would be able to use your gift for the building up of the body of Christ. And the point is, in verse 13, it says this, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does this emphasize? Till we all come is that we're all progressing together as we use our spiritual gifts to build one another up. It's an amazing thing. Now, what I want to emphasize to you is that it really shows the importance of these spiritual gifts and, the, and why you should come to church. Because the fact of the matter is, is that you will not be able to use your spiritual gift with other believers around you if you're not around other believers, right? And so when you come to church on Sunday morning, I believe that there are gifts and talents and abilities that are represented in it, so many of you. But that you can only use those things as you're joined together in the way that God wants you to be. And so when you're here, God is using you. And think about the way that God can use you, right? To pray for somebody, to give somebody an encouraging word. I don't know, to help somebody out, maybe at a different time, even after church. But as you come around, as you stick around and engage with people around you, wait and see how God will use you. And be ready for that because God is gifting you supernaturally in order that we would all come to the faith, to faith progressing together to one whole, one body. Now, uh, another way to think about it is this. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle, right? Each one of these little pieces have been uniquely formed and shaped to fit with one another for a beautiful picture at the end. Actually, I hate jigsaw puzzles. The reason is, is that my kids all have them, but they're always missing pieces, right? They're always missing pieces. So I get to the end, I'm supposed to have this beautiful picture, but all I can do is focus on the piece that I don't have. Maybe I'm neurotic just like that, okay? Now, the thing is, is that that's exactly uh, the good picture of church, right? Is that we're all there, except there's one piece that's missing, right? And then we can't form that beautiful picture that God wants us to form because that person is either outside of the frame, right? Those pictures, those pieces that you don't ever know what to do with, you know, at the end of the, uh, putting together the puzzle. You're the outside the frame where it's completely lost, and so what God wants is he wants to uniquely form and shape you to fit together in the body of the church, but you got to be here to do that, right? Otherwise, the picture doesn't look complete. And that's the whole point, is that if Pastor Nate and I could all do this all by ourselves, we wouldn't need you guys. But the fact of the matter is that Scripture actually teaches that each one of you is of utmost importance to the working together of the body. And that's why Paul uses the analogy of the body, Right? Imagine if you were trying to run around and you had no foot. It wouldn't work very well, right? So uh, we need one another. The whole point is that you're here and anointed for God's purpose within you, and I hope that you get engaged and involved within the church. Well, one of the questions that you may be asking today is you might say, what is my spiritual gift? I have no idea what it is. Well, 
what we would like you to do is we do a spiritual gifts assessment. We sit down with you. Uh, actually, uh, Ken that's over there in the Connect Tent can sign you up for this. And we'll have a time where we can sit down and find out what your spiritual gift is so that you would know what it is, so that you can be fit in and feel like you're in your sweet spot of ministry. We just don't want you to come and be like, well, we need five guys in the parking lot, so why don't you go out in the parking lot, right? We're not, we try not to do it that way. But if you have the gift of helps and you do like setting up cones and you do like directing traffic and that is your sweet spot, we'd love to put you in the parking lot. Anyway, um, if it's spiritual gifts and your use of them is utmost important to the church, if God just wanted you to come and sit in a chair, uh, that would be fine. But there's so much more than that that he really talks about through Scripture. The last section of Scripture that I'll read to you today is verses 14 through 16. It says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which each part does its share causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now that's a big passage and there's a lot of things in it, but the point of it is this, is that God's design for the church is that we would all grow up in maturity together. We shouldn't be children, and when Paul refers to children, he means those that are impressionable and weak in our faith and easily uh, thrown off. We shouldn't be carried about by every wind of doctrine, every trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. There will always be those doctrines around, those teachings that are not of Jesus Christ and that sway people off. But the way that we kind of counteract those things, the way that we guard ourselves against those things is by the use of the spiritual gifts and the unity that that forms so that we would be one body growing together as a whole into maturity. Um, what counteracts these false teachings and all these things that might trick us or trip us up is really speaking the truth in love. And Paul has four things here. He says, speaking the truth in love brings growth in all things into him who is the head. Speaking the truth in love brings a joining and knitting together of believers with each joint fit together. And speaking the truth in love brings the effective working by which every part does its share and finally, speaking the truth in love causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, the point is, is that speaking the truth in love becomes the way that we're able to use our spiritual gifts with one another for a unified whole, growing up into maturity in Jesus Christ. And that every part, every person that's even sitting here right now becomes a part of that effective working for the whole. Now, as I said... You have to invest a little bit in order to get there. You might think, I'm at the start of the journey. What do I do? I'll tell you the first thing that you do is just stay around with us after the service instead of getting in your car and just come and spend time with us and eat coffee and donuts and introduce yourself to people. Just talk to people and find out more about them. They'll talk to you, and you'll start to feel a little bit more knit into the body. You'll start to feel a little bit better. Then, in a couple weeks, we're going to roll out our community groups, our small groups. It's a great way to be fit into the body and to start to use your spiritual gifting even in a smaller scale setting, right? You can come to one of our events or our Tuesday prayer night. All those things make you feel more connected to the church that you call home. And we want that for you. We want to know you. We want to have you be a part of this thing because the more that you're a part of this thing, the more that you start to grow and see value in coming. Uh, I've heard it said before is that there's no Lone Ranger Christians, which is what I used to be for a long time before I, I really came back to the Lord, is that I would just go in and I would sit like in the back pew. And then I would leave before anybody could say hi to me. If you're one of those people, would you raise your hand today? I know you're not going to raise your hand. I know you're not going to raise because you're in the back. You're like, I'm getting out of here, man. This, is, this, this place is crazy. They want to get to know me. That's not why I come to church. It, it, but I used to be that kind of person because there was... There's stuff in my life that I, needed to, that I needed to take care of, right? That I needed to take care of before I was integrating the body. And as I took care of that stuff, you know what? I felt more comfortable being at church. I felt more comfortable getting to know people and getting plugged in here. And that's what God wants for you, that he wants for me, is for us all to be joined together, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, I don't know what your unity struggle is today but I know that you probably have one. 
There's probably some person in your life that you know that you have that unity struggle with. And it's being humble, patient, gentle, and kind with that person. That might be your unity struggle. That may be where you need some prayer today. Or it might be that you've had some church hurt in the past. We've all had church hurt. We've all had things done to us that are in church that are just seems like just how did that happen? Just kind of weird things. That might be your unity struggle today. And you might be like, how am I going to get plugged into Anthem? I don't feel like I can really, you know, even, you know, let my heart out again. That might be your unity struggle today. And maybe your unity struggle is that you never really plugged into a church. You just kind of wanted to be on the outside. You don't know if you really want to get involved in this thing because it might just take you in a place that you're uncomfortable with. Well, that might be your unity struggle with. And God wants to take you from your lone ranger status and bring you right into the body. But as we close today and the worship team comes up, I do want to pray for you. Whatever your struggle is, and of course we'll have the prayer team over to the side as well. Because I believe God wants to do something. Again, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit means that the unity is already there. It's just a question if we want to uphold and preserve and maintain that unity. It's, a, it's something that we don't need to strive for. It's something that's already that God has put within us that we just need to release and allow out. Uh, in a moment, um, we're gonna also going to take communion this morning. Just remembering that in the bread and in the cup was something that Jesus did with his disciples the night before he died. That same time in the upper room, that's when he broke bread and, and, and drank the cup with them. And he passed the bread around. And then they dipped it in the wine, and they had communion together. It really represented the unity of the body of Christ just in that act of communion. So as you prepare to take communion today, we remember the unity that we have in Jesus Christ by that very act that we do of taking communion. So we'll be doing that in just a moment. But whatever your unity struggle is, I hope that the Lord has really revealed that to your heart and that you'll come up even after communion. We'll have the prayer team right over here. Uh, again, we'll um, examine ourselves, allow the Lord to speak to us, and then we'll take communion in just a moment. If you haven't received the cup, would you please raise your hand today, and the ushers and the greeters will come out and give you the cup. Jesus, thank you so much for your loving kindness. Thank you for the unity that you died for. You prayed that we would be one and that we'd be all a part of your amazing body. And then you ascended into heaven, and then you gave us spiritual gifts that we could use for all time to encourage one another and to love one another and to grow up in maturity with one another. So Jesus, I pray for those that are maybe having a struggle with a brother or sister in the body. Lord, that might be their unity struggle. I just pray, God, that there just be a reconciliation today, an attitude of unity, Lord, a loving one, bearing with one another in love and a gentleness there, Lord. And where there was harshness and where there was critical talk, Lord, I pray against it in Jesus' name and that the unity and the bond of peace would be upheld. I pray for those that have church hurt, Lord, that it's affecting their unity. Would you bring healing upon their hurt, Lord Jesus, and give them the strength to once again open their heart to be used of you. Lord, and I do pray for those that have never really plugged in and just think, I don't know if I really can get involved in this thing. I pray today would be a breakthrough moment for them. So, Lord, as we prepare our heart for communion, would you speak to us in Jesus' name? Amen.